I will call the remote hearing of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today is April 12th, 2021. This meeting is held in accordance with Rule 10.01, which was passed and allows for remote hearings. All remote hearings are recorded and live streamed by House Public Information. The clerk will take attendance by roll. Chair Hanson is present. Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, present. Uh, Heitzman. Heitzman, present. Akum. Akum, present. Eklund. That looks like she is just joining. Uh, Backer. Backer, present. Eklund. Present. Becker Finn. Present. Fisher. Fisher, present. Green. Present. I go. Present. Jordan. Jordan. Uh, Keeler. Keeler. Lippert. Lippert, present. Lewick. Lewick, present. Morrison. Morrison, present. Nelson. Nelson, present. Uh, Tice. Tice. We'll go Tice, back up. present. And then uh, one more call for Jordan. Jordan, present. Uh, Keeler. All right, quorum is present. Forum is present. The next item on the agenda are the minutes for Thursday, April 8th, 2021. Uh, Representative Lewick, do you, have you looked at the minutes? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, and I would move the minutes. Representative Lewick moves the minutes for April 8th, 2021. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Ayes have it, the minutes are approved. Uh, our uh, one bill on the calendar today is House file 600 uh, by Representative Winkler. Um, I do see Representative Eklund has a question. Representative Eklund. I pushed the wrong button, Mr. Chair. I apologize. Okay, that's okay. Uh, is Representative Winkler here? Yes, Mr. Chair, I am here. I will move that House file 600 be recommended to be re-referred to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. Representative Winkler, uh, do you have an author's amendment as well? Uh, Mr. Chair, I do, and I would uh, appreciate the uh, committee's um, willingness to put the bill in the shape that I would like to present it today. I will move the A-17 amendment so we can get the bill before the committee in the way that the Representative Winkler would like. Representative Winkler, would you explain the author's amendment? Well, uh, Mr. Chair, the uh, amendment goes and makes a, a number of uh, changes on the, the um, uh, feedback from uh, stakeholders, from advocacy organizations, uh, from state agencies, and from uh, members based on prior bill hearings. Uh, and so there's a, a lot of it that does not necessarily directly relate to the um, Environment Committee, and I appreciate the committee's willingness to take up the amendment uh, as a courtesy to me, but uh, essentially uh, the amendment uh, just brings the bill into uh, conformity on a number of issues uh, as we have evolved this uh, over the last year and a half. Uh, and um, I'm happy to answer you know, specific questions on various provisions, but uh, my intention would be to put the amendment on and then present the bill and then go to testimony. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Representative Winkler, uh, just to be clear, you said that the amendment uh, makes a connection on a number of issues. Could you help lay that out for the committee? It didn't really describe the amendment, at least in my mind. Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman. So we make changes uh, to the cannabis, uh, not the cannabis management board, the cannabis management advisory committee to prohibit uh, lobbyists from who are registered from serving uh, on that committee. Uh, we make a number of changes uh, to the uh, available delivery methods for cannabis. 
uh, uh, on the, in the medical program uh, to keep that in conformity with the changes in the medical cannabis program that are being uh, carried by Representative Edelson uh, in her bill. Uh, we make changes to some of the uh, grants uh, for cannabis uh, use disorder, and uh, we make uh, changes at the request of the PCA um, related to uh, rulemaking. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Winkler. That's helpful. Appreciate it. Any further discussion on the A-17 amendment? All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed say nay. No. Ayes have it. Motion is adopted. The amendment is adopted. Representative Winkler, to your bill as amended. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. Uh, I recognize that we are uh, in the Environment Committee, and I will try to uh, primarily address the uh, matters in the bill that relate to uh, energy and uh, uh, runoff and other kinds of environmental related issues. Uh, but I want to say at the outset that this bill, first and foremost, is in recognition of the major racial disparities in how our current drug laws are enforced. Uh, in looking at this bill as a whole, I would uh, ask members to consider the fact that uh, we have similar cannabis use rates uh, across populations in Minnesota, but we have disproportionate policing and, law and enforcement uh, as applied to African-Americans in Minnesota, anywhere from four to 10 times uh, greater arrest rates. Uh, we have whole communities that have been adversely affected by the war on drugs uh, that include uh, felonies for relatively uh, small amounts of cannabis uh, uh, possession and use uh, that not only affect the person who receives the, felony, fenal, the penalty of a felony, uh, but can affect that person, their family, their community for years and years. The collateral consequences are significant. So when you look at the kind of industry that we are trying to create with this bill, we are doing so with that background in mind. And when you look at the kinds of environmental standards contained in this bill, uh, there is an element of environmental justice included in this, uh, as well as the, uh, the fact that we want to create an industry in which the communities and individuals most adversely affected by the war on drugs will have an opportunity to participate in the upside of that business. Uh, and so we have, uh, and as we're doing so, we have an opportunity to create the kind of new industry that can be a model for not only how to be inclusive and how to repair past wrongs, but also to do so in a way that upholds very high environmental standards. The way that we do that is to create, uh, an to create a regulatory body that is not there to promote an industry, but is to regulate it and help promote the policy goals that we have set forth. Uh, we create a cannabis management board separate from any state agency. The cannabis man management board is appointed by the governor. The cannabis management board uh, is required to set uh, environmental standards related to uh, the use of wind and solar energy, uh, the requirement of purchasing credits or offsetting for um, any energy use uh, that, that is uh, beyond wind and solar, to create a um, water requirement that uh, sets very high standards in consultation with the PCA, require reuse of wastewater and the use of filtration systems for removing contaminants from wastewater. And we essentially are trying to create an industry that will do no harm uh, as a result of a product uh, whose prohibition has done great harm, uh, great harm to communities across the st state, great harm to individuals, uh, and, to, and has done so in a way that is uh, very heavily based on race. So uh, members, uh, I think this, this bill is a very, sets a very high standard for environmental policy. And the advantage that we have in, in creating it in this way is that we're not trying to regulate an existing industry or change the way an existing industry does its, uh, conducts its business, conducts its operations, but rather we are setting a high standard based on what we want to create, the kind of state we want to have, 
And that's what this bill represents from an environmental standpoint. Thank you, Representative Winkler. Uh, we have several testifiers. If the testifiers could keep their uh, comments to the environmental sections of the bill, uh, and we've allocated four minutes uh, for each testifier, and I will hold them to that. So uh, first up, Marin Schroeder. Chair Hansen, members of the committee, my name is Marin Schroeder and I am the Policy Director for Sensible Change Minnesota, an organization that is working primarily to improve medical cannabis access, prevent accidental drug overdoses, and reduce the harms of our inequitable criminal justice system. Our team consists of medical cannabis patients, parents, caregivers, advocates, and consumers, and I want to thank you for letting me speak today. HF 600 is the labor of thousands of cannabis supporters, dozens of advocates and policy experts, along with several committed lawmakers, including representatives Winkler, Gomez and Hansen. This legislation will create one of the best cannabis regulation programs in the country. With a focus on equity and responsibility, this bill puts in place a number of provisions that our organization is supportive of that will make this new and emerging industry environmentally responsible. Specifically addressing water use and quality, energy use and sol solid waste disposal while promoting clean energy, this will help to ensure Minnesota's cannabis industry meets the highest environmental standards. According to the National Cannabis Industry Association, one of the primary goals in the environmental protection is to displace the unregulated and unsafe illicit market. As an unregulated industry, cannabis cultivation and product production have no environmental standards to meet, and this has caused significant environmental damage throughout the country, including negative impacts to soil, water, energy, and air quality. Regulation of this industry is necessary to protect our environment and natural resources. I would be remiss if I didn't mention the existing risk to consumers of products from the illicit market. Currently, hundreds of thousands of Minnesotans consume cannabis and only a small fraction are registered in the canna medical cannabis program. These consumers are obtaining their products in legal states facing criminal consequences for bringing them home, or they're obtaining their products in an illicit market which lacks safety and regulatory controls. With the passage of HF 600, we will make Minnesota a safer, more inclusive place for all of our neighbors, and I urge you to support this bill. Thank you. Thank you. Marcus Harkis. Thank you, good afternoon. My name is Marcus Harkis. I'm a family man, I'm a writer, organizer, and social entrepreneur from North Minneapolis. I'm also the director of the Campaign for Full Legalization and a co-founder of the Minnesota Cannabis College. So I've studied the history of prohibition and the emerging legal cannabis industry since 2014 when Colorado and Washington State implemented the nation's first adult use cannabis markets. As a black cannabis consumer for the past 22 years, I can tell you without a doubt that prohibition is the problem, not cannabis. Cannabis is a healing plant, not a dangerous killer drug. The most dangerous thing about cannabis is getting caught with it because you can lose your freedom, lose your job, lose your housing. Sometimes people can even lose their children. Um, prohibitionists will argue that legalization causes the sky to fall, but it has not. Even with inequitably regulated, overly taxed legalization models, the free states are respecting personal freedom. They're increasing public safety, improving public health, creating economic development, and advancing social justice by ending the senseless criminalization of cannabis consumers. There's not one honest reason to justify prohibition, which has failed to stop the existing billion dollar illicit market that now serves nearly 700,000 adult Minnesota cannabis consumers today. The only way to displace this illicit market is to allow the emerging legal market to work well for both entrepreneurs and consumers. House file 600 does well in proposing a craft market that will create thousands of businesses, tens of thousands of jobs, and pro provide a wide variety of safe products for consumers to enjoy. We're learning from the best practices and the mistakes of the four running cannabis free states. This potential has the, the, excuse me, the potential to establish the best model of full legalization in the United States, one that intentionally redresses the wrongs of the failed and structurally racist drug war with equitable regulation and progressive environmental standards. I thought I only had two minutes, so I can stop now, but, uh, Please vote to advance this smart bill. Thank you. 
Thank you. Anthony Newby. And members, if, if you could just state, or uh, the testifiers could just state who they're with and uh, uh, for the record. Mr. Chair, it looks like Mr. Newby's audio is still Actually, connecting. Is it, uh, can, does that help guys? Yep, we yep. can see you now, yes. All right, sorry about that. Honorable Chair and, com uh, and, co and Committee members, my name is Anthony Newby. I'm a Minnesota native and I'm the owner of a CBD business located downtown Minneapolis. It's with a heavy heart that I address you today. Like many of you, I'm a parent of a teenage son and I'm tracking events in Brooklyn Center. Uh, in the Chauvin trial, which is being held just a few blocks away from my business, uh, where I'm located now. I'm hopeful that cannabis legalization and House File 600 will offer a desperately needed bright spot uh, on the horizon and um, will help to make a better future for all of us here in Minnesota. My CBD brand, Cultivated CBD, is sold in over 600 retail stores. We sell online and ship to 30 plus states throughout the country. I'm also a member of the Minority Cannabis Business Association, an organization with a network of cannabis operators throughout the country, helping to inform equitable cannabis policy in emerging states like Minnesota. As an operator in the legal hemp and CBD market, I can tell you that my team and other business owners I work with are obsessed with building a sustainable cannabis economy. Similar to other ag businesses in Minnesota, there's something about the cannabis plant and the industry itself that fosters collaboration and thoughtfulness. This means we think often about social equity, workplace standards, consumer safety, and environmental sustainability. In my experience, the hemp and adult use cannabis industry is already ahead of the curve when it comes to green, the green energy revolution. And this bill, House File 600, could make us a national leader. For my company, environmental sustainability means that we recycle and upcycle as much as, uh, of the plant as possible. All of our plant material is used either for sale as an assortment of retail products or sent to processor friends for extraction. We look for environmentally friend friendly vendors for packaging and printed materials down to the recyclable packing peanuts in our shipping containers. The best growers in our network grow organic products powered by clean and renewable energy. This isn't just us, uh, this is true of cannabis business operators throughout the nation. Some examples of favorable policies in House File 600 that I'd like to uh, restate some of the things that uh, uh, Representative Winkler has already stated. Uh, but from our perspective, Section 7 in particular has some very high environmental standards. There are uh, line items that address uh, environmental standards related to water use and water quality, energy use, solid waste disposal, remediating odor, uh, energy standards uh, as it comes to solar and wind energy. The bill encourages the use of electric vehicles for delivery services for cannabis products. It establishes a plan for medical companies and manufacturers to transition to solar and wind energy or pr purchase approved credits to offset the use of other energy sources within a five-year window. Section 14, as it relates to licensing provisions, there's an environmental plan. Uh, it, it, there's a provision for veterans, uh, security and record keeping, employee training, business and financial planning, on and on and on. And, and, and personally and important to me, uh, my business and my family, there's social equity and, and diversity plans built into this policy that makes it among the best in the country. In terms of long-term potential, House File 600 gives uh, Minnesota a chance to expand on our long history of agricultural excellence. It'll allow Fortune 500 companies like Cargill, 3M, General Mills, and others the opportunity to create new products and industry standards, and will most importantly, uh, from my perspective, give an on-ramp to small businesses like mine, a black-owned and operated company, uh, which now has a chance to create an economic toehold in a national moment of racial and economic crisis. Thank you, committee chair and members for the time today. Please pass House File 600 out of your committee and allow this bill to create a best-in-the-nation cannabis model for the rest of the country to follow. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Leili Fatahi. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Leili Fatahi, and I am the campaign manager for Minnesotans for Responsible Marijuana Regulation, or MRMR. And it's my pleasure today to testify in support of House File 600. MRMR is a statewide multipartisan campaign organized by leaders from state and local units of government, 
a broad range of nonprofit organizations, Minnesota's business community, organized labor, and more. And many members of uh, this committee likely recognize me today more because of my work in environmental advocacy than my work in cannabis legalization. I've had the privilege of testifying before this committee and meeting with many of you over the years on such issues as oil pipeline, sulfide mining, vehicle electrification, my personal favorite environmental rulemaking, and, and many other things. And this committee has jurisdiction over the areas of law and policy that I perhaps know the best. And it's against that backdrop that I ask this committee to vote in support of House File 600 today, not just because of the bill's provisions to ensure that a legal cannabis industry is accompanied by strong protections for soil and water management and the expansion of renewable energy, et cetera, all the things that uh, our other testifiers have spoken to, but also in recognition of the fact that the prohibition and the criminalization of marijuana has had a disproportionately adverse impact on the social, natural, and built environments in Minnesota's communities of color, and that it continues to be a devastating driver of environmental injustice today. Um, you know, marijuana has been the pretext for vastly disproportionate over-policing of communities and neighborhoods of color. Uh, as Representative Winkler mentioned, you know, despite similar rates of usage, uh, black individuals in Minnesota are over eight times as likely to come into interaction with police over, uh, over cannabis than, than white Minnesotans are. Um, as a consequence of that over-policing, we've seen chronic disinvestment from these communities and neighborhoods, um, money and resources that in uh, wider communities uh, we see invested in parks and in environmental cleanup and environmental amenities and renewable infrastructure and such, we often see in communities of color going towards investment in law enforcement and corrections all of which have not had the impact of making anybody safer. Um, and so I, I really uh, ask for this committee's support on, on this bill, um, both on, on the substantive reasons that other testifiers have spoken to, but also in recognition that this is not an issue that is tangential to the jurisdiction of this committee, but really strikes at the core of, of ensuring um, equitability in terms of what people's uh, environments look like. Thank you. Thank you. Diana Tasted Damer. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Diana Tasted Damer. I am the Director of Organizing and Legislative Affairs with the United Food and Commercial Workers Local 1189. Local 1189 proudly represents cannabis workers at one of the two medical cannabis manufacturers in the state, Vireo Health. I am here today to lend UFCW support for House File 600 authorizing and regulating adult use cannabis. Similar efforts are underway in multiple states across the country. Adult, adult use cannabis enjoys public support that transcends the political spectrum, both, both nationally and here. It's time for Minnesota to embrace these realities. I wanna thank Representative Winkler for his authorship of the bill and for his thoughtful and collaborative approach for, in crafting this legislation. House File 600 is a comprehensive package that will provide new economic opportunities to those most disproportionately impacted by a prohibition model that has failed so many for so long. This foundational approach we wholeheartedly endorse. Authorizing and regulating adult use cannabis will provide for thousands of new direct jobs in the cannabis industry and support thousands more in supporting industries. Regarding this committee's jurisdiction, we want to acknowledge that provisions at seek to ensure this new industry is a responsible environmental partners in the area of water, energy consumption, waste, and recycling. The bill grants authority to the Cannabis Management Board to establish by rural industry environmental standards. In addition, potential license applicants are required to submit an environmental plan as part of their applications. 
A great deal of innovation is happening in this space around the country. Consideration and planning for these impacts on the front end will help create an industry that not only provides opportunities for economic activity and new jobs, but also addresses environmental and consumption impacts, which will encourage innovation and collaboration. This will set the industry on a firm foundation from the onset, one that protects consumers, operators, natural resources, and the health and safety of the cannabis workers who will make this happen. We encourage the committee to approve House File 600 as amend amended. This concludes my remarks. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh, that's it for testifiers, members. Uh, any questions for the testifiers? I do want to note that we have the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and the Minnesota DNR available for any questions as well. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And to the bill author or MPCA, it might be either or. Uh, I am wondering if it's anticipated that these facilities producing cannabis or engaged in the production of how, whatever product or, or uh, uh, other uh, manufacturing process would need, is it anticipated they would need a, a water discharge permit from MPCA or air, I suppose that would be also a concern or question. Ms. Gothier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you for the question, Representative Heinzman. When a new industry Ms. comes Ms. into- Ms. State your name. Oh, sorry. My name is Greta Gothier, Assistant Commissioner, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. When a new industry comes into the state, we typically sit down and look at how they function and issue the appropriate permits, whether those are air, water, solid waste, et cetera. So the amendment that Representative Winkler put on the bill today will uh, make this uh, very uh, transition about this transition very smooth, and we will be able to work with this new industry to determine um, what permits they do in fact need for their processing facilities. Mr. Chair. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, not at all attempting to be snarky or anything, but do we do we anticipate that we will need permits in those categories that I mentioned or not? I mean, maybe we just don't know. That's fine too. I'm just wanting to find out. Ms. Gothier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Representative Heinzman. Um, I do have our industrial division direct director with me, um, Mr. Wetstein, and perhaps he would be better equipped to handle that specific question about whether the cannabis industry would need water permits. Representative Heisman, do you want me to ask Mr. Webstein? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. If someone could answer the question, that'd be great. If Mr. Webstein could, that would be just fine. Mr. Webstein, and introduce yourself uh, for the record. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Doug Webstein, I'm the Industrial Division Director at the MPCA. Uh, the MPCA um, stormwater, wastewater, and air emissions uh, permitting programs are, are set up to handle uh, whatever um, is proposed. Uh, there may be uh, instances where they, uh, they, they're they exempt from permitting uh, or they would need permits, but all of that is determined by the uh, interaction that Commissioner Gauthier was talking about or any applications that we receive. Uh, so it's sort of a, it depends answer to the question based on size of the facility and the types uh, and volumes of emissions that may be emitted. Representative Heinzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, honestly, it sounds like we really don't have any idea if MPCA is going to be needing to permit air or water emissions from facilities, uh, which I respect if that's the case. Uh, I hope that we can get a better idea before we're passing said legislation. I think it would make sense to have those questions uh, uh, fully uh, vetted before we're bringing something like this to the floor to pass out of the House of Representatives. So uh, I'm not sure who would be maybe the, looks like Representative Winkler has a- yep. uh, Representative Winkler. Well, Mr. Chair, Representative Heinzman, I think that you ask a fair question. I'm not sure 
that we could give a definitive answer uh, based on what I'm hearing from the PCA, but I would be more than happy to look at typical operations in other states and to try to have a little better understanding based on how the industry typically works uh, at some point before we bring the bill to the floor and potentially before we even get to the Energy Committee. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Representative Winkler. I appreciate that. I do think it makes sense that we have a definitive answer on that. Uh, and this one I may have wrong, but I'm, I'm also wondering, Mr. Chair, if, if DNR is the appropriate agency to do enforcement on environment standards, shouldn't it be MPCA? If I'm reading the bill correctly, it appears that DNR is tasked with that enforcement. Um, maybe I've misread the, the bill, but somebody could maybe explain that one way or the other. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Uh, Reverend, or Ms. Gothier. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, to your question, Representative Heinzman, um, that may be the case, but I will state that whatever permits we do give to this industry, we would enforce our own permits. So if, the, okay. if a facility is a growing facility and they do water their plants and they need a watering, a water permit, we would enforce that. If they're a processing facility where maybe they're doing other things that they have air emissions but not water emissions, we would enforce that permit too. And I'm happy to work with you, Representative Winkler, on looking at other states and figuring out kind of what, what we can expect from this industry in terms of how we would permit them. Representative Heinzman, and we got a couple other questions. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll actually pass on my remaining questions as there is a list. Representative Dr. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Chair. My question deals with um, two of them, it can go both of them, but, you know, with me being in the ag industry, we know in the past that there's been a lot of concerns of nitrates and ammonia and fertilization um, and the side effects on that. How, how does, I mean, this is a plan, it needs to be fertilized. So it's a two-part question, what's MPCA going to do to regulate that? Um, um, I know it's going to be done in, you know, greenhouses and different things like that, potentially, who knows, maybe out in the opening. That's my first question. My second question, do we know when we have these, lack of a better choice of words, um, um, marijuana farms, how much water will a plant take? How much water will be taken out of um, the environment and, and, and so forth with growth? So I don't know if the author would know that or... MPCA, um, what type of impact those two things would have, please? Representative Winkler, you want to take that first? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I think this also partially um, responds to what uh, Representative Heinzman was asking. I want to be clear that the Cannabis Management Board is the agency that is responsible for uh, licensing, for requiring the permit, the license holders to uh, file plans for all environmental standards. The rules that the Cannabis Management Board puts in place has to be done in consultation with the PCA and consistent with PCA standards and at least at the federal standards. So uh, in your license, if you're a cannabis uh, cultivator, your, your license to do that is dependent on your compliance with environmental standards. And the Cannabis Management Board has the authority to uh, inspect premises to conduct depositions and investigations and ultimately to rescind licenses for operation uh, based on non-compliance. So, uh, uh, you know, I'm, the, 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 you know, I don't want to say necessarily the primary jurisdiction for a permit pulled through MPCA is done through the Cannabis Management Board. That would not be true. But the Cannabis Management Board has authority to um, address all of those issues and set standards for all of those issues, including uh, pesticide use, uh, and other kinds of uh, uh, products required to grow healthy plants. So uh, the, the Cannabis Management Board is really primary and works in consultation with other agencies to set these standards for this industry. And as for, I mean, cannabis uh, is a uh, uh, water intensive uh, industry, uh, energy intensive as well. That's why we have such high standards in this bill. Uh, we anticipate, um, and I think it's with a pretty high degree of likelihood that almost all uh, cultivation will be done indoors. Um, so I don't want to create the impression that it's uh, you know going to be primarily rainfall or something uh, you know coming from the natural environment that's directly going to be watering uh, cannabis plants. It will be primarily indoor facilities. Backer. 
I appreciate, appreciate that, um, um, Majority Leader. I, I'm like Representative Heisman. I'm concerned that we're putting a lot of, um, we, we need to have these discussions. Amount of water that's going to be pulled in, nitrates, pesticides, um, which I do appreciate your answer at the end of the day. Um, this is very important to the environment. I have other concerns that are not environmental related, but I'm keeping this discussion to the scope of this committee and so forth. Um, I am also really concerned that we had a testifier that talks about this will um, boost the agriculture industry. In my area, no one is interested in growing marijuana, period. I do want to share that from one of the richest farm areas um, of the state. So um, I will end there, and I do appreciate your everybody's time. Thank you. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my question, I guess some of my questions, I would like to say they've been answered, but actually they uh, they just gave me a little more heartburn. Uh, it seems like uh, none of this has been looked into yet. I know that in the ag community, uh, for irrigation, for instance, that we talk about a lot, uh, our, uh, our farmers can't even get an irrigation permit until they first prove that they're not going to affect the water. Uh, uh, other other uh, instances where you can't have you can't be putting chemicals on till you till you see what's going into the water and how it's going to affect the water. And this stuff has been going on in other states. And so my question was, uh, has either the author or the MPCA looked into the other states? And apparently that's not the case. And so the question then would be, is there going to be any uh, uh, effort to to do the study? Of, been, of what's been going on in the states where this is already legal to see what the problems are before we even move forward on this. Representative Winkler. Mr. Chair, Representative Green, uh, with respect, I, I, that isn't the case. Uh, we have, in fact, examined uh, the uh, experience of other states. We have looked at energy use. We've looked at water use. And I would direct you to Section 7 uh, of the bill uh, in Article, uh, well, I think it's Article 1. Um, in which we have uh, high water, energy, and solid waste and, uh, and uh, odor standards in the bill and require the Cannabis Management Board to establish those standards because we are concerned about the environmental impact of this new industry. Uh, and so we cannot uh, uh, tell you how the industry is going to uh, meet its water and energy use standards. Uh, we will, can only tell you that they have to in order to have a license. And based on the experience of other states and the uh, input of people in the industry, we believe that they can meet these standards and that's why they, they're uh, in the bill. Representative Green. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Representative Winkler. So then the question to the MPCA is, uh, have, you, uh, have you had any effort at all in, uh, in looking into the problems uh, with runoff, problems with water drawdown, uh, air pollution in the other states. Have you made any effort uh, prior to this bill coming forward to look to that when, when this has kind of been on the back burner for a long time? Ms. Gothier, uh, if these are facilities, they'd be point sources rather than non-point, correct? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. And Mr. Chairman, also the DNR handles water appropriation, not the PCA. So they, I would defer to them. But to your question, Representative Green, yes, we have looked into it somewhat. We know that there, for example, have been odor, odor issues with the in industrial um, marijuana industry in the state of Washington. But because most of this is going to be indoors, you know, and also we will work to learn what we can from other states. So um, if this bill was passed into law, we would immediately do, um, again, a thorough investigation. And so we could be ready to uh, equip this new industry with whatever permits they need to do business in Minnesota. Senator Green. That uh, would be all, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Representative Lewick. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question uh, for the DNR and, uh, and uh, uh, Representative Winkler, with respect to uh, the 
market and the organization that uh, will shadow all the licenses. In other words, uh, and we've had people from law enforcement from a variety of states that have legalized marijuana come and talk to us over the years that uh, despite legalization, that did not end uh, the illegal trafficking in, uh, in this substance. It changed the market significantly, the dynamics, in some ways it made it easier uh, to traffic in that type of stuff. It changed the cost dimension, but it did not uh, eliminate the illegal movement of that stuff. So I guess who specifically is going to be responsible to uh, make sure everything is licensed? Nobody's out there operating outside of a license. Is that going to be a DNR conservation officer? Is that going to be a bunch of special agents that the board will have to hire? Or is that going to fall upon uh, the local county sheriff's department? Uh, just seems like I, I don't see anything in the bill that's very specific about uh, uh, how you're going to deal with that. And we, there's no question, uh, at least from the law enforcement folks that we've heard from in the other states, that uh, that dark world industry is going to continue. Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Representative Lewick, first of all, uh, we have the advantage of seeing what's happened in other states and where they have made mistakes. Um, for example, California has done a rather poor job of creating a legal regulated marketplace that essentially eliminates the illicit marketplace. In California, they had a very uh, loose uh, medical cannabis program that essentially allowed you to grow a great deal of cannabis on your own uh, with very loose medical requirements. Uh, then they uh, created a legal regulated marketplace, a commercial marketplace with uh, taxation rates that were extremely high, very limited numbers of licenses and very high regulatory burdens. Uh, which made it very expensive and difficult to get access to. And so you essentially had the worst of two worlds in California. Uh, in Colorado, they ran into the, the problem of having uh, certain counties that could opt out uh, of legalization. So essentially, you guaranteed a continued illegal marketplace in the state of Colorado by having local opt-outs. Uh, and in, and in uh, both of those states, you can have substantial outdoor uh, uh, growing facilities uh, and produce a, you know, a, you know, a, a large quantity of cannabis. In Minnesota, part of what we're doing is, well, first of all, our, one of our primary goals in this bill is to eliminate the illicit marketplace. That is why we are not proposing this bill as a huge revenue raiser for the state for other purposes. We want to keep taxation at a low enough rate that we are not creating a disincentive for uh, the formation or transition of this marketplace from, from an illegal marketplace to a legal marketplace. Uh, we don't have a license fee for uh, getting a cannabis license. You have an application fee, but you finally don't have a fee to hold the license, which you have in many states. We're also permitting local units of government, of course, to have their standard zoning restrictions, time, place, and manner type restrictions. Um, but they are not allowed to essentially make cannabis illegal in their local unit of government by imposing regulations that effectively create an illegal uh, marketplace. So we are learning lessons about what went wrong uh, in order to migrate as quickly and, and, and entirely the uh, illicit marketplace into a legal regulated marketplace. Uh, second of all, enforcement uh, is based on uh, the local jurisdiction, if you are engaged in the illegal trafficking of cannabis after uh, this bill becomes law, you are, you are uh, violating state law and subject to state uh, criminal uh, sanction and apprehension. Uh, we're not creating any special detective force at the Cannabis Management Board to go around and uh, root that out around the state. And I would also add that the, the penalties that we have in place for illegal uh, sale or use are substantially lower than what they are now. Um, so we are essentially shifting from an illegal marketplace, learning the lessons of other states. And I believe uh, as this becomes, as cannabis becomes legal across the country, you're going to see a much smaller illicit marketplace in Minnesota as, as th than uh, what you've seen from states that were ex uh, experimenting early on. Representative Lewick, was that it? Uh, I guess just a 
quick comment. I, I'd be concerned that uh, uh, even with the provisions you've outlined, that uh, uh, that's not going to uh, make the, Ill the Ill illegal market go away. Uh, and it's certainly uh, rather frustrating that uh, the uh, local county sheriff's office and uh, I would suppose when you get out onto state public land, uh, the conservation officers are going to be uh, involved in uh, in chasing after this, unless you're going to uh, create a special group of revenueers, kind of like we had with the old uh, initial prohibition uh, business uh, that would work for the board that would be out there uh, trying to take the load off the local units of government. So I, I've got some say I've got some major reservations with this as an understatement. But anyway, appreciate uh, the conversation. Thank you. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Representative Winkler, for bringing this together. Um, I'm really happy to see that we have this baked into from the onset um, permitting related to environmental uh, issues around waste and water. So thank you for being so thoughtful on that from the onset. Um, I was hoping you could give us some more details. You said that this was um, also an environmental justice bill. So I was hoping you could talk a little bit more about the environmental justice provisions and what specifically um, you'd like to highlight that and that we should be thinking about when we're thinking about environmental justice. I think a lot of us wish we could um, think about environmental justice when creating a new industry. Um, and it's great that we're thinking that through. So can you tell, talk to us a little bit about the provisions related um, to communities of color and environmental racism? Representative Winkler. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Representative Jordan. I think at a foundational level, uh, when we are trying to create this industry, we wanted to uh, create uh, small and craft sized businesses, which require uh, less capital to start than a you know, very large uh, corporate style cannabis business. Uh, access to capital is one of the uh, biggest challenges, of course, for any new business to form. And we know that there are significant disparities in access to capital. Uh, based on race, um, as you know, uh, which is true, of course, in general, and uh, it's going to be true, especially in Minnesota. So, uh, a lower, a less capital-intensive industry is one way in which we ensure that communities of color participate in the upside of this business. Uh, we also have social equity licenses. Uh, we have grants and uh, navigation uh, funds for uh, communities that have been adversely affected by the war on drugs to be able to uh, better navigate and participate in the industry. And we actually have capital grants. So all of that is to address the uh, economic uh, and social inequity. From a, an environmental racism standpoint, we don't want to create a new industry in communities of color that is uh, going to pollute, that is going to make uh, reduce uh, air quality, that is going to produce runoff that is uh, disadvantageous to the communities in which it is uh, operating. And so the high standards in this bill combined with the goal of, of building this industry uh, in a way that uh, communities of color uh, especially can participate in the upside is at, is, is at the heart of the uh, construct of this bill. Representative Jordan. Thank you, Mr. Chair, um, and thank you, Representative Winkler, for that answer. Um, I, I really appreciate that we're baking, that we are moving this into everything we do. We know that communities of color have been adversely affected by the war on drugs and adversely affected by pollution and environmental racism. So thank you for keeping that in mind, and thank you to the testifiers for also pointing that out. Um, I think it's going to be important that as we move forward in any industry, but new industries in general, that we are keeping in mind environmental racism and how that's affected it. So thanks for being so. Um, proactive on that. Representative Ackland. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'm sorry, but my video is not working again today. So um, I wanted to ask you a question, Mr. Chair. I would, I have some, some more general questions about the uh, bill. And I'm just wondering if we have time for that. It really doesn't have, have to do with the environment, but if we do, I'd like to ask them. And if not, I'm okay with holding holding back. Um, Representative Ackland, we have uh, several stops more on this, uh, plus the floor. I would like to, I think we've done a pretty good job of keeping it to the environmental concerns, and I'd like to stay there because I think we could uh, we could spend a lot of time on overall on the bill. So uh, I'd 
If they're not related to environment, I'd ask if you can save them to another committee that you may be on or for the floor or follow up with Representative Winkler uh, directly. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Members, any other questions related to the environmental provisions of the bill? Representative Winkler, any closing remarks? Thank you, Mr. Chair and, and committee. I appreciate your taking the time uh, during a busy time of this legislative session. Uh, I also wanna thank uh, the members of this committee and others who spent uh, many, many hours working to put this bill together in conjunction with cannabis advocates in uh, talking with the industry, uh, with regulators. I want to express my appreciation to the MPCA and the DNR uh, for their uh, willingness to work with us in, in helping to, to create a model for what a new industry can be in Minnesota from an environmental protection standpoint. And uh, Representative Ackland, I am more than happy to talk about this at any time and am happy to have a direct conversation with you or uh, uh, have that conversation in committee uh, down the road. And, um, you know, I would just say this. Uh, I have heard concerns raised uh, by committee members today. The state of South Dakota has legalized cannabis. The state of North Dakota is about to legalize cannabis. We are not going to be able to stop uh, the, the effective legalization and decriminalization of cannabis from affecting Minnesota. Uh, the question is not if, the question is how and when. Minnesota needs time to get this right. This bill represents not only a tremendous amount of thought and work put into crafting the bill, but also gives us time to uh, put together the kind of regulatory and other changes that will make it a success for the state. And so members, I ask for your support of the bill today. We need to get this right. This, is, this bill represents the best step forward Minnesota can take on this issue. And if we uh, wait and let it happen to us, we will be much less happy than the uh, results that we would get with this bill. And so I would ask for your support today. Representative Winkler, I appreciate the uh, uh, precedent setting environmental protections that are incorporated into this bill. And I also wanna thank you for the transparency and accountability provisions to prevent regulatory capture in this uh, new industry. I will renew my motion that House File 600 as amended be recommended to be re-referred to, to the Judiciary Finance and Civil Law Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Hanson, Rick. Aye. Hanson, aye. Waslowick, Amy. Waslowick, aye. Waslowick, aye. Heinzman, Josh. Heinzman, no. Heinzman, no. Acom, Patty. Acom, aye. Acom, aye. Acklin, Susan. Acklin, Susan. Backer, Jeff. Backer votes no. Backer, no. Becker, Finn, Jamie. Aye. Becker, Finn, aye. Eklund, Rob. Aye. Eklund, aye. Fisher, Peter. Fisher, aye. Fisher, aye. Green, Steve. No. Green, no. I go, Spencer. No. I go, no. Jordan, Sydney. Jordan, aye. Jordan, aye. Keeler, Heather. Keeler, aye. Keeler, aye. Lee, Foo. Lee, I. Lee, I. Uh, Lippert, Todd. Lippert, I. Lippert, I. Lewick, Dale. Lewick, no. Lewick, no. Morrison, Kelly. Morrison, I. Morrison, I. Nelson, Nathan. Nelson, no. Nelson, no. Tice, Tama. Tice, no. Tice, no. Uh, once again, Ackland, Susan. Ackland. So that is 11 eyes and seven no's. The motion prevails. This will be our last regular meeting of the 2021 legislative session. Uh, we are looking to see if we can schedule, actually I probably should have asked Representative Winkler this uh, before we voted, but we're looking to schedule uh, a hearing on CWD as an informational hearing uh, uh, we haven't been able to fit that in, and I think there's some important news coming. So uh, watch your calendar for that, uh, and we'll try to fit that in between other events. Uh, any additional meeting, other committee meetings will be scheduled by the chair. I want to make sure we thank uh, our committee staff, Janelle Taylor and Bob Eliff from House Research, fiscal analyst Brad Hegemeyer, committee administrator, Peter Strohmeyer, committee legislative assistant, Adam Kopel, 
partisan researchers Molly Peterson, Amy Zitko, and we want to thank the House Public Information uh, Office who has made this available to Minnesotans around the state and around the country. Uh, I just want to thank everybody for this. We have done a lot of work uh, in a very short period of time. We have more work to do, and I appreciate working with you. We are adjourned.